Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, the internet's busiest music nerd, and it's time for a review of this new Drake album, For All the Dogs. This is a brand new LP from rapper, singer, songwriter, Aubrey Graham, aka Drake, Toronto's very own. It is his eighth full-length LP, and it is a follow-up to 2021's Certified Lover Boy. And yes, I know he has dropped Honestly Nevermind, as well as the 21 Savage collab project since then, but I think this record kind of goes to show that those albums were detours, in a sense. Um, for all the dogs, Drake is really kind of getting back to what makes Drake Drake. Now, Certified Lover Boy was one of my least favorite Drake projects so far when it came out. Another unnecessarily long project with some of the most preposterous creative lows of Drake's career. Endless whinging about how lonely it is at the top. Stale shots over beef that is years old at this point. And one of his goofiest singles to date, Way Too Sexy, which is just a few shades away from being a Lonely Island song. Now, of course, this record did have its moments here and there. If you're getting 21 tracks from one of the industry's biggest artists, you are going to have some bangers here and there. But Drake Drake has currently reached a point where he's almost too big to fail, which is a dangerous scenario considering that he might be the music industry's most self-aware artist right now. Not dangerous for Drake per se, uh, more dangerous for us because he understands he can do basically anything at this point and it will create engagement. So it doesn't matter if his writing is subpar, it doesn't matter if he riffs his way through an album that barely has any formal songs on it, it doesn't matter if he's instigating beef that's unwarranted. At the end of the day, it's all more money in his pocket. Drake's current stranglehold on the music industry is showing no signs of waning, even with him having just announced a hiatus after this record. And if he does genuinely get some distance from the music industry at this point, I hope it gives him an opportunity for a reset or something. Because for all of this project's novel hype and marketing, uh, plus that poetry book thing. I feel like with Drake here, we're getting another bloated head scratcher that leaves me wondering who exactly is this record intended for, from front to back. Because he seems to be less interested in perfecting a sound, and more interested in giving everybody a little bit of something, while lacing this record with the kind of stuff that he knows is just going to generate conversation. Blowout features, rhymes that make you wince, shots, callouts, subliminals, and bars that could also be construed as such. And all this is happening while narrativizing about how his success is hard-earned, and all of his ex-lovers are clownish and stupid like, uh, you know, any given boyfriend in a Taylor Swift song. So basically this record is the most Drake thing ever, essentially. And the formula is so clear now, as I don't think Drake is driven to make albums that are good, I think he's driven to make albums that are polarizing. And also difficult to sum up, because there's a variety of great and terrible moments on this thing, and uh, none of them are great and terrible in exactly the same way. There's also a bit of theater of the mind going on with this record too, as there are numerous tracks with long intros, outros, these transitional moments to BARK radio breaks that have uh, various people acting as DJs on this fictional radio station, Snoop Dogg, Sade, which is for sure cool and adds a lot of fun and character to the flow of the record. But at the end of it all, it's the songwriting quality and the writing quality uh, that this record is going to live or die by. Now, I can give this to For All the Dogs. The album does start off pretty strong. You have the opener, Virginia Beach, which may not be a Tuscan leather or a champagne poetry, one of those uh, long, bar-heavy Drake starters where he's got a great flow and vibe going. This track goes in more of an R&B direction, but the sung lines are really well-conceived. They're sticky. Aubrey is absolutely floating on this beat, which is honestly beautiful. The chipmunk vocal samples, the string layers, it's entrancing, it's hypnotic, and kind of reminds me of the, the sort of beat Clams Casino would have made for ASAP Rocky or Lil B back in the day. Drake lyrically is also reminiscing about a relationship, a love that uh, actually used to have some substance to it, some life to it. It feels like there's genuinely some focus to this track. And even if there are bars like, you know, put a baby in you, you're a hot mom, I do think it's a good start to the project. There's also Amen that features Tizo Touchdown, who is absolutely wonderful on the intro of this track. His vocal lines, his harmonies are gorgeous, they're luxurious. It is a classy R&B cut with some gospel splashes here and there. Drake brings some solid rapping to the table. Yes, of course, there are a few eye rolls here and there lyrically. That is to be expected but vocally, musically, the track is sound. And while I love that Drake is definitely building up some momentum here, we do get a quick nosedive on Calling For You featuring 21 Savage. Which, what the hell is this track? You have an intro that lasts forever, super tedious, Drake doesn't really know how to fill it out vocally, and it eventually just kind of goes into this long spoken word uh, rant by some unidentified girl, unidentified to me anyway. She's going on about like a trip and drama and ox. 21 Savage's verse at the end of it is utterly average. It's just several different moments and ideas jammed together into something that just 
is not a song. Following this, we have Fear of Heights, which is a pretty big switch up from Drake, as it is him doing a rage style track in the vein of Playboy Cardi. You have those buzzing, cycling synths. He is getting really breathy and a little quietly aggressive on his delivery. It's a convincing performance with a sick flow. And it's kind of surprising that Drake jumps into this kind of vibe, especially after such a slow and sleepy intro where he's dropping all of these, you know, uh, the anti and auntie bars that at one point he says that he has to stop because obviously it's a terrible direction and a corny idea, but uh, there has been a lot of talk and theorizing as to whether or not uh, some of these bars were in reference to Rihanna. Either way though, Drake, I guess he thinks he's Cardi here, but it's still a banger and somehow harder than uh, a lot of what Cardi has put out recently on his opium label. Don't tell me you're scared little Drake. To tell me you're scared little Aubrey. Then Drake is pretty much scratching the same itch on the following track, Daylight. He thinks he's Cardi twice. And honestly, this track's kind of a banger too. Interestingly, toward the end of the song, uh, we get this boom bap style beat switch where his son Adonis is spitting and it's a cute appearance. It's endearing. Adonis carries. We also have a little carrying going on with the following cut first person shooter, which features J. Cole. Cole goes absolutely off over this kind of sick, moody, grimy beat, talking about how he and Kendrick and Drake are the goats, so on and so forth. Drake's line toward the start of the track about this being as big as the Super Bowl, but it's just two guys playing <laughs> shit that they made in the studio is pretty funny too. And for sure, it's gonna go down as one of the biggest mainstream bangers of the year. Now, surprisingly with this rage stuff, Drake dips back into this well again with I Don't Give a Fuck, which features Yeet. Another thing about this track that is a big surprise is that it features this uh, long, expansive, new age, ambient intro that has uh, some jazz trumpet in there too. It sounds almost like if Julia Holter collaborated with Miles Davis. It's beautiful. It's genuinely awe-inspiring. But then, uh, suddenly, we get this annoying Benny X beat jumping in with um, <laughs> Yeet just going, and while I don't mind Yee and I like this uh, production and I like this vibe genuinely in certain contexts, I just feel like lyrically this cut is just too dumbed down even for Drake. Plus he feels like a feature on his own song here as again this feels like a Yeet beat, Yeet takes up most of the track, and he already dropped two good rage tracks on the record already, we didn't need a third. Following this we have 7969 Santa which um, feels like I'm listening to a Drake dream sequence. The beat is very faint. He's rapping very introspectively and quietly on the song. There are lots of ambient synth patches on the track and these disembodied Chief Keef samples playing very uh, distantly. There are some cringeworthy bars here and there, but I, I just feel like I'm in Drake's mind on this one in a weird way. And you know, it's not a bad cerebral switch up. Plus there's this uh, beautiful Tizo touchdown outro on the track. And all this transitions us into the number one track featuring SZA, Slime You Out, which admittedly, since I have originally heard it, has grown on me. The vocal lines are strong. The beat is fine. It does the job. SZA's feature on the track is stupendous, and I like that both Drake and SZA bring their own separate narratives to the song so that it creates some tension. The cute series of bars toward the end of the track that reference the months of the year from Drake uh, are fine. Maybe it's because there are elements of the track I enjoy more now. Maybe it's because hearing it next to some of the worst material on this record, it's a far superior song. Either way, I think this track is a highlight, which I'm not sure I can say about behind Hama's Promises, which for sure is bringing back some real old Drake R&B vibes. But all the bars about all the things we could have been and how you fucked up my Bahamas trip just seems so petty and lame. My Bahamas trip, Haley! You ruined my Bahamas trip! The whole track feels more like a R. Kelly style musical rant, uh, you know, rather than a song, which is kind of funny given the bar later on the record where Drake is uh, uh, allegedly judging uh, someone who he's with for like, you know, bumping R. Kelly in the whip. Things pick up from here though with Tried Our Best, which I think is genuinely a top 10 Drake song. I do wish the straight flight line and the Shakespeare line just wasn't there, but the vocals on this track are so much better than vocals on previous records, not only in terms of performance, but uh, just also in terms of the melodies he's busting out here. It's a good tune, it's a great structure, Drake is seriously in his R&B bag again. Screw the World is a pretty fun interlude. Meanwhile, Drew Picasso brings us yet again another R&B style musical rant which is where that R. Kelly being bumped in the whip line pops up. Also, moving like Snoopy and Charlie Brown, you trying to dog the kid? 
Stop. Following this members only featuring Party Next Door narratively is a track that seems like Drake just doesn't know what the hell he wants. He's talking about his connections with this girl who he sees as being like, you know, too gangy, too close or good with the guys, I guess. Cause there are so many tracks on this thing where he clearly wants somebody who integrates into his life, integrates into his world, but I guess they can't get too close to the point where you know, they're they're good with his dogs to the point where he might think a bar like, uh, feel like I'm bi because you're one of the guys, girl. But what's even more concerning and sus is the track What Would Pluto Do? Pluto being the nickname of frequent collaborator and friend Future. And musically, it's a solid R&B tune, sure. But I think we can agree this is not a strong or essential topic. So I left that song feeling very aggravated uh, and then went into All the Parties, which at the start has very good pacing, a standout appearance from Chief Key where he brings a pretty catchy refrain to the table, but then the track kind of just fizzles out from there, has no ideas to where to go. Drake repeats the same refrain that Chief Keef brought to the table, but with like the beat slowed down, then it just trails off with a terrible shot at the weekend for no reason whatsoever. Toward the end of the track, there's also this very quiet and random interpolation of Pet Shop Boys' A West End Girls, which again is totally coming out of left field and not even like shown off in the song in a way that is prominent or memorable. I have no idea uh, why he did it and did it so brazenly because seemingly there's no credit to Pet Shop Boys on the track, at least that's what they said on Twitter. 8 a.m. in Charlotte, I've talked about before in a review. I think it's a banger and a half, good single. I like the direct boom bat beat on the track. Drake's delivery is solid too. There's tons of standout bars on this one. Like that one about 15 years of domination, things are bound to get kinky. I would say the only Achilles heel of this track is that it yet again shows Drake not truly knowing what he wants. Cause while he raps repeatedly about uh, letting beef slide and kind of just wanting to be a more peaceful person, he's also kind of instigating beef. Not just here, but all over this record. BBL Love is loaded with some of the most ridiculous bars on the entire project, but Drake is clearly being kind of silly and just taking the piss on this one. I wouldn't take anything happening on this track too seriously, but simultaneously, if the song does expose something, it's that when Drake is being serious, he's not that much less silly and tongue-in-cheek than he's being on this cut, which makes me wonder, how seriously should we take you when you are being serious? The song Gently, featuring Bad Bunny, is is just, in my opinion, completely a non-starter, as Drake sees Bad Bunny's appearance as a reason to, uh, yet again, mimic a another accent uh, in a terrible fucking fashion. I live like Sopranos, Italianos. What is he doing? What is he doing? Does Drake know that, you know, you can just let somebody from a different country or culture rap on your track without, like, impersonating them? Like, imagine if Taylor Swift had Rosalia on a track and then just saw that as cause to be like, yeah, a biblioteca. Rich Baby Daddy is uh, another track on this record that uh, despite it being kind of a hot mess, I sort of love it. It features Sexy Red, it features a super driving, galloping, danceable beat. Uh, SZA is on the track too. And it's completely, completely unhinged, especially with Sexy Red jumping in with uh, some raunchy bars, with talking about twerking for Drake. I don't think this track is gonna be for everybody, but uh, there is an outro on it that I, frankly, at least for me, even though I liked the cut, kind of ruined it. Thanks to Drake dropping some very moody, contemplative R&B style bars like a post-nut clarity, I came to my senses. And weirdly enough, there's another interpolation on this cut of uh, a Florence and the Machine song, this time credited though, with Drake singing about how the dog days are over. Things on the tail end of this record really start to get boring with Another Late Night, where Drake throws out open threats toward anybody making, you know, Millie Bob Bobby Brown jokes. We have a light quirky trap beat on this cut. It feels like the vibe of a Lil Yachty song, so of course it makes sense that Lil Yachty is on the track. Uh, however, Lil Yachty's feature on this track is trash. My bitch know it's us without open either of her eyelids. And also, she had big tits like Billie Eilish, but she couldn't sing. Weird that Drake would put a Lil Yachty song on his record only for Lil Yachty to fuck it up. Away From Home sees Drake uh, rapping in a very monotonous, repetitive fashion as he is kind of walking down memory lane, recalling all of this stuff that he had to do or go through in order to get to where he is today. And the tone of this track is just kind of confusing to me because in so many ways, even though 
things have panned out very positively for Drake. He still seems like really bitter about some of the stuff that has transpired in the past. Some of which doesn't even seem that bad or serious or, you know, even if you did take it as such, wouldn't these be obstacles for you to sort of like overcome or, you know, just stuff that you had to move through in order to get to where you are now? The most confusing moment is uh, this spot where he mentions Esperanza Spalding. This is such a random person to like throw a jab at for no reason. And moments like this just make lines like, uh, to keep it real, I wasn't really gangster until now I was living on a cloud, I was quiet as a mouse. Kind of funny because like, would a real gangster be going at Esperanza Spalding's throat? No. Then the closing track, Polar Opposites, completely unnecessary. While it does tie up uh, some of the loose ends on the record in regards to, you know, this really crappy relationship that he's been singing and rapping about and uh, how toxic and divisive it's been. By that same token on this cut, Drake is sort of diagnosing this girl with bipolar disorder. Does he know that that's the case? Which is kind of weird and sus. And look, I, I cannot let go of bars like, uh, you tried to grease me, but we're not in Mykonos. Like, what? Why? And again, I feel like Drake has kind of dropped all pretense for bringing us any songs at this point. He's just kind of like, you know, riffing and whining through these tracks. And to be honest, this record really could have ended at 8 a.m. in Charlotte, and it would have been the better for it. Because once again with this LP, we're just getting a lot of Drake bloat. Maybe he was a bit more strategic about placing it all toward the end, but it's still there. So look, ratio of bops to flops on this thing, it is better than what we had on CLB. That for sure is true. I was happy and impressed to see Drake do as well as he did with some of these rage cuts, with some of these cuts that had more focused songwriting and went in more of an R&B direction. You have some of those classically Drake moments as well on this thing like 8am and Charlotte, but it's still not a well-groomed and consistent record and I think Drake, unfortunately, uh, just doesn't really have the full capacity to edit himself effectively at this point, as there are so many bars and tracks just flying on this thing that don't really add to the overall vibe of the record. They weigh it down, they bog it down, or just moments that are tacky and tasteless and just straight up terrible. Drake album is gonna Drake album, essentially, at the end of the day, and I'm not really sure if there's too much else to say about For All the Dogs. I'm feeling a strong five to a light six, on this one, transition. Have you given this album a listen? Did you love it? Did you hate it? What would you rate it? You're the best, you're the best. What should I review next? Hit the like if you like. Please subscribe and please don't cry. Hit the bell as well. Over here next to my head is another video that you can check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano, Drake, forever.